turn to lifestyle factors, right? So yeah. we've been thinking about um, supplements and, and what we can do, but, but lifestyle factors. So what do you think about uh, kind, kind of diet? What, what, what would you see as the best diet? And yeah, yeah. Is it, so one thing I'd like to think about in there, in biology, there, there's no solution, right? There's only trade-offs. So mm-hmm. what do you want, what do you think is important to optimize for within the diet, right? Mm-hmm. Is it protein synthesis, lean mass, lower mTOR? Mm-hmm. Yeah, how do you think about it? So, so this is a very interesting question. And I came to change my opinion on that throughout the years, actually. Mm-hmm. And for me, um, nutrition is very important. And it has been throughout my whole life. So I've been experimenting myself with different kind of diets, basically. So 10 years ago, I was a vegan uh, for mm-hmm. three years. And then I realized that um, it doesn't fit me that well uh, anymore. So I switched back to consuming meat and seafood. And then um, back in 2019, I started experimenting with low carb diets um, and also intermittent fasting. So we can talk about all those things. So what happens is that there there are different clashing opinions out there, right? So there are people that swear by the vegan diet and there are people that swear by the carnivore diet and whatnot. And what's, I think that um, surprisingly, there is, I came to realize that there is no one diet that can feed everyone, right? When it comes to their maximum um, health boosting and and performance and whatnot. And this is because um, diet is actually affected by many things. So it could be even down to your blood type, or it can be down to your individual digestive system and your microbiota. And I have a couple of interesting comments here, <laughs> because uh, basically, you know, you have people like Brian Johnson, that is uh, doing something that is actually very admirable because, you know, he created the blueprint and he provides all this knowledge for free to, uh, um, you know, to, to the broad audience. And I think this is wonderful. However, when it comes to diet, um, it's very interesting what he said in an interview that I was watching that, uh, you know, for all of the interventions that he does, including supplements and, uh, you know, exercise and some, some other biohacks that he's implementing he has a very robust evidence-based approach with experimentation with tracking his biometrics and his uh you know doing all these blood tests and whatnot so he's doing that but then when he was asked about his diet and why he's particularly um implementing the vegan diet he said that it's out of the personal preference that he has Mm -hmm. because um you know a vegan diet comes across as something more compassionate for the animals and the pl- planet, which is great, right? Like, I'm not saying that this is bad, but uh, the thing is that he's very objective with all the interventions that um, that he applies to himself. But when it comes to the diet, he's actually not that objective, right? So he just has a personal preference. And to me, it's interesting to see that um, he um, he is on a caloric restriction on a permanent basis and he's doing the intermittent fasting and he consumes a particular uh, amount of, of, of calories under 2000 calories, I think, or whatever um, on a vegan diet. But then he has all this supplementation that basically gives him the nutrients that, for example, another diet uh, would offer to him. Uh, more abundantly, such as, uh, let's say, um, a more primal diet with more meat and so on. Um, and then because of this diet that he's doing, because of uh, and the caloric restriction, he actually says, well, I can see that my testosterone is going down, so I'm utilizing a testosterone patch. So for me, this is a bit weird, because if you're saying that you're trying to optimize for longevity, and you're basically saying that you believe that the diet that you have is the optimal for you, but not only you need all of this supplementation, but also your hormones starts being impacted negatively because of the caloric restriction and the intermittent fasting and the particular macronutrient composition of your diet, then this means maybe this is not the optimal diet, right? So just just my two cents on this. 
And um, as I said, I currently am on a high protein, high fat diet. Uh, after implementing the ketogenic diet for a couple of years, last year, I made the switch to a carnivore diet um, for about a year, which was incredible for my body. And it was very interesting to see that despite the fact that I didn't have a significant change in weight. So I never had a problem with my weight, actually, like with maintaining optimal weight, which is around 51, 52 kg, uh, which is normal for my height. Um, however, the fat redistribution um, in my body was remarkable. So like loaf handles gone, right? And there is a biology behind this because when you're going into low carb or no carb, uh, carnivore diet, what happens is that you don't have the insulin spikes in your blood anymore, right? Because there is no mm -hmm. carbohydrate to spike it. And this comes back to basically millions of years of human evolution with no carb consumption whatsoever, because we only started introducing carbohydrates into our diet 15,000 years ago uh, when we started mass agriculture, right? So before that, our diet was just meat from animals that we were hunting down and consuming, and then an occasional mushroom and berry and, and you know some root vegetables every now and then, right? So this was the primal nutrition that made our our brain to, to, to be developed. And... Um, there was one leap in human evolution and in the development of human brain that came with the discovery of fire, because then we basically started cooking meat, meaning that we could consume more of it because uh, basically when you're cooking your meat or your food, it's like um, uh, an extra uh, layer of processing, right? So it's like mm -hmm. an external stomach that you have. So you did, you break down some things that uh, could not be digestible by your digestive system in, a, um, in another case, and then you eat it. So then you can consume and absorb more nutrients and, and you know, the macronutrient composition from your food is changing. So you're doing that. And then if you combine this with um, you know, with optimal exercise, optimal, um, you know, lifestyle, being respectful of your sleep and things like that. I think that this is producing great results. So uh, back to the question of what I think is the optimal nutrition. I think there is no such thing as one diet fits all, but at the same time, we also need to use our common sense, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're vegan, like it's inevitable that you will be going into macronutrient micronutrient deficiency eventually. Like there is no way around it because you can't get the micronutrients that you need um, to to optimize your your brain and your cognitive performance from the vegan diet. There is simply not enough nutrients. And then of course, when uh, we're talking about decay and aging. So protein consumption is crucial to mm -hmm. maintain, you know, to offset sarcopenia, for example, which is um, the muscle degeneration that we all get after the age of 40 uh, and it starts creeping in. And then this, of course, um, can affect bone density and other things. So protein consumption, definitely very important. I don't believe as a scientist that there is a, a way to get all the protein that you need from a vegan diet. And there is a lot of information out there, uh, right? So talking about different uh, sources of vegan proteins, such as uh, legumes and lentils and whatnot. However, what I found is that those foods are actually highly inflammatory. So then you create a different uh, problem for yourself because then you have all this uh, ongoing inflammation going on in your gut because when you're consuming a lot of fiber and fiber is um uh, is, is some of the fiber in in vegetable and, and vegan sources is basically um edible and could be broken down uh by your digestive system and some of it is not some of it is actually inedible like we can't digest it at all and we basically you know uh, excrete it later mm -hmm. so what happened there is that when we're consuming such high fiber um foods, we will inevitably have this inflammation going on in your gut. And this could create different kinds of problems, um, you know, from, from more predisposition to, to cancer and whatnot, to, uh, um, to, to inflammation that will be impairing your uh, brain function as well because of the gut-brain axis. So there are a lot of 
things going on in the human body. And uh, I, I definitely think I'm a big believer in, you know, um, doing things that make sense, right? And if uh, we're talking about a lab protocol, for example, so in my lab, you know, would have a protocol for an experiment and we would say, okay, well, we need to do A, B, C, D, E. And then the last thing that you always need to check as a researcher, uh, let's say you're making some calculations for some reagents. Okay, does this make logical sense, right? Because if you made some calculations for, let's say, volume of reagents, and then you have those little vials of like one, two ml, but then you make your calculations for the reagents and it actually says 50 ml, like there is definitely a mistake there, right? Like there is definitely something that went wrong along the way. So you always need to ask yourself, does this make logical sense? And I think this is a this is something that we can apply to our nutrition and our lifestyle as well. Interesting. So uh, do, do you have like a figure for the amount of protein per per weight, like kilo, uh, you know, grams per kilogram that you target? Yeah, I mean, there are different numbers out there. So, um, you know, there, there are researchers recommending anywhere from 1.2 grams of protein per, per kg of weight to 3.5 to 4. Wow. Now, uh, for me individually, I don't really count my calories and mm -hmm. I don't count particular grams of protein. Like I probably count it as approximation in my head, mm -hmm. but uh, my nutrition right. right now is very... Um, it is very standardized. So uh, after I tried the carnivore diet last year, even if I'm not on a strict carnivore diet anymore, I, I'm still on, on low carb diet, of course, but at the same time, um, I basically make sure that, um, not even make sure, but like my body naturally gravitates toward the carnivore diet. Uh, and this would be just a few same uh, ingredients that I would be consuming on a regular basis. So, um, for example, steak and uh, meat, cheese and eggs are all ingredients that are always in my uh, in my fridge. My freezer is just full of free buy steaks uh, that I consume on a regular basis. And um I know that uh, a 300 gram or a 400 gram steak is a very good amount of protein for one of my two meals a day because um, I've been doing intermittent fasting for quite some time as well. Uh, and usually it's two meals a day. So uh, I have a 20 hour fasting window on most days and then four hour feeding window with two meals apart. So one is breakfast at 11 a.m., which would usually be cheese and eggs. Um, and just a bit of a low, uh, low fiber as well. So this could be some cherry tomatoes, uh, or something like that. And the reason for that is that if I'm going back and forth, if I don't want to be eating three ingredients for the rest of my life, because we also have social life, right? So we, we get invited to social events and whatnot. So the, uh, variety of the food that I'm consuming might be fluctuating sometime, but in order for me to be able to digest all the food that I want at any given time, this means I need to preserve the gut microbiome that can digest protein, fat, but also fiber and carbohydrates, right? For the occasional dessert. And I think that as a woman, it's actually, uh, you know, like sometimes it's, it's harder to stick to a particular diet because you have all these sugar cravings, carbohydrate cravings because of the fluctuation in your hormonal cycle, right? Then I'm definitely, I'm guilty of that, right? So once or twice a month, I would have this craving, I would want a dessert. And if I want to consume the dessert, I need to preserve the microbiome that will enable me to actually digest it. And in order to do that, so the the um, uh, the microbiome species that are digesting both fiber and carbohydrates are the same. And if you're just feeding yourself just a low amount of fiber without going into this inflammatory uh, nonsense of like high fiber diets and like huge salad bowls, like, and, you know, again, like I was guilty of that in the past. I was a vegan for three years and I was eating all this huge salad um balls right and then i was wondering oh my god why am i bloated all the time <laughs> why do i have indigestion so i i tested out for myself and it was not the optimal diet for my digestive system um 
However, now that I'm on the carnivore diet, I would have just the right amount of fiber to maintain uh, this good bacteria in order to be able to digest anything I want at any given time. Um, so this would be my breakfast. So just uh, a few cherry tomatoes and an omelet of four or five eggs plus cheese. And this would usually be after my morning workout. So I'm working out fasted because this seems to be, um, you know, very beneficial for health because it activates your twins and AD plus production and all this thing. So working out fasted, then have a big omelet for breakfast around 11 midday, something like that. And then my second meal of the day would be around 3 p.m., which would be uh, a steak usually with some cheese on the side. And um, th this is my personal diet that I think fits me well. And if I'm at home by myself, like those would be the ingredients that I will be consuming on a regular basis. So I don't have much variety. It actually simplifies your groceries for you as well, right? So I don't have to <laughs> show for all these uh, different ingredients. And I keep it simple. And then uh, on different social occasions, if I'm dining out, like I might be having some some other um, ingredients as well, including seafood. Interesting. So you, you talked about your workout. So for, for your workout, cardio, hit, resistance, mm -hmm. what do you do? Yeah, so, so I'm alternating. So I have one or two brutal workouts per week, which is my tie or boxing with my personal trainer. And then after that, the other days, uh, the other let's say three, four times, I would just do a bit of cardio by myself, just treadmill, cycling, things like that. Uh, maybe one, one time a week, I would do a bit of resistance training because it's actually worth noting that uh, exercise is has undeniable um, evidence behind it when it comes to longevity and preserving our optimal health, right? Um, but again, the I think the goals for men and women when it comes to exercise are a bit different. So for example, for me, I don't have the need as a woman to maintain huge muscle mass, right? So I'm actually like, I'm pretty lean uh, when it comes to, um, uh, to, to my body composition. However, I do want to have this cardiovascular challenge, which is the brutal workouts twice a week to basically uh, make sure that I maintain a good VO2 max. So VO2 mm -hmm. max is our capacity of uh, oxygen consumption in our muscles, right? And the way you train it is you basically keep on running out of breath as much as possible. And then this will increase your VO2 max. This is like the simple explanation. Um, so that's what I'm doing. I love martial arts. I love Muay Thai. I love kickboxing, boxing, mm -hmm. all these things. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the thing there. <laughs> hey, that's cool. Cool. I, I was more into jujitsu, but uh, yeah, uh -huh. ma martial arts is brilliant. Yeah. 